right, we're in the uh, first chapter, or we're in John, first chapter, and our professional worker is preparing to sit down so she can read for us. <laughs> um, Pastor Larry's sermon series is on uh, various Christmas hymns, and today it's What Child Is This? Now, I'm, I'm going to attack this for you from the standpoint of some titles, and i um, then we're going to get into a little bit of Greek and a little bit of Hebrew, and there's a specific reason for it, okay? Because I, I want you to see the what, what child really this is that we're talking about, and I hope to expand your understanding of, uh, of the Christ child and, and for what all of this really kind of uh, circles around. So uh, as we begin to read this, I want you to recognize that you're going to see a tie to the book of Genesis, Okay, and for those of you that uh, struggle with the Trinity, this, uh -oh. this is going to overwhelm you. Okay, and, and for a few, I mean, for some of you, it'll be really easy. For those of you that struggle with the Trinity, um, no names named, Stoney, but but it will blow you away. Okay, now the reason that it's important that you begin to think about Genesis is because John, remember, this is the disciple John. Okay, James and John, brothers. Uh, John becomes uh, the second most uh, prolific author in the New Testament. Paul wrote about two thirds. John uh, writes a couple of books. He writes John, first, second, third John, and he writes also the book of Revelation. Revelation, very good. So just recognize that John is he is really preparing his audience for who this is, okay? Go ahead, Stacey. The true life, the good life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. You read 9 through 13? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Now we're going to back you up a little bit. Um, I, I want, I want Stacy to also read uh, 1 through 8 for you now. But before she does, before she does, I just want to take you back. To, uh, to the book of Genesis, and very quickly, uh, let me read to you the very beginning of the Bible so that it will help you to uh, solidify your, your thinking here as we go into this. Now, uh, what we're going to hear from Stacy in a moment about John coming into the world is not the disciple John, but rather it is who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, yeah. And so Good Genesis man. chapter 1, verse 1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the Triune God, was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So John, who, he wrote to all the churches. John, the, the, the gospel writer here, John, wrote to all the churches. And he, um, he was writing to them about this concept. Uh, the Greek word is logos, uh, which means word. He was, he was making sure they understood that Jesus is the word of God. Okay? He is the word. <coughs> Stacy, one to eight, please. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Okay, so uh, again, the, the gospel writer John is making sure that everybody understands that that uh, the, the, the John the Baptist, who at this time is still, he's passed now, right? Because Herod cut his head off. But, but 
And he is still a legend. He is still uh, in the circles who are reading this letter that John writes, uh, the, the gospel of John. Um, he, is, he is absolutely... Um, he is absolutely in the middle of it, and um, and he's writing because people are still getting confused about who was John, who was John the Baptist, and who was Jesus, and he's trying to set the church straight on this. So look at your outline. You see in the beginning here, and he begins with this concept of in the beginning, right? So remember, the gospel writer John would be very familiar with Genesis, right? Um, that's how the Jew was educated back in those days. They had the, the Pentateuch is the Greek for um, the Torah, uh, which would be the first five books of the Bible, okay? And so that, that's, what, that's how they learned to read and write. And that's how the families discussed their faith was through those first five books. So he would have understood the concept of in the beginning from Genesis. And now he's beginning this new concept of people, okay, in the beginning. And there's four key words. Most of your translations you probably have use these four words as well. Word, creator, life, and life. Word, creator, life, and life. You may not have seen Jesus in that, uh, in that aspect before. Because uh, for some reason in the Christian church, we seem to... Uh, move on from this topic it, it, because it's it's not uh it takes you back and forth the old new testament a lot of times when you start thinking this way kind of left and right brain and for a lot of people it's not very comfortable so we we just don't have this conversation but um you have to appreciate that when we sing at christmas time we sing about this 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 baby coming okay god incarnate right and so um we, we kind of get a little confused about well, was this the beginning of Jesus, or was this some other form of Jesus than the original Jesus? And, and the answer to that is, this is not the beginning of Jesus. The baby that's born to Mary is not the beginning of Jesus. The beginning of the humanity of Jesus, okay, but not Jesus himself. He was at the beginning, and that's why it's introduced that way in Genesis, and in the end, why John ties it back in there. But look at those four titles, word, creator, life, and life. What's the commonalities of these titles? What, what kind of commonalities do you see and feel in this? Synonyms for God. Synonyms, okay, good. Anybody else? Beginning. Beginning, okay. Anybody else? I want you to think about the concept of action. Okay, think of action here. Uh, words are actions. Creating is an action. Life is an action. Light is, it, it brings into things, right? It's kind of action, all kind of action items that you have to think about. And that's beginning to be important for us. And here's why. In, in many of our faith walks, <laughs> God is a distant concept for most people, even for people who often say, I've been to church my whole life, and you know, I believe in God, and, and that's good, but they, they see a distant God, and I want you to think about God more in your life, a God of action who is involved. Part of the reason that we understand this concept of Christmas and, and the baby Jesus is because God takes action to bring the baby Jesus into the world so that man has a chance to get a glimpse of God, okay? And, and we, we don't kind of see it that way a lot of times. So now let's go to verse 8. It, it, it says this, he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, okay? So he's talking about John who? The Baptist. The Baptist, right. So I want you to recognize that sometimes our purpose is like John's. We can't always be the light, but we can always be a witness to the light. Okay? We, we are witnesses 
to God's son. We don't have the capacity to be God's son. But the only way we can articulate that, and we articulate that a lot, in particular I do, uh, we talk about this concept of being the hands and feet of Jesus, right? Um, many of you in your professional uh, experience, in your professional careers, you have had to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, you've been in, in careers, uh, education, and healthcare, um, and in other professions where you have interaction with people in stressful circumstances, right? And uh, I want you to appreciate that you may not be Jesus, but sometimes you are the light. Sometimes you are the witness because they'll get it nowhere else, right? Particularly in stressful, uh, stressful situations. And, and so I want you to appreciate that Sometimes our purpose is like John's the back, John the Baptist. You know, we can only witness Jesus. We can only witness about Jesus. We can only witness for Jesus. But there's still action that's capable in their lives, right? So think about that concept for a moment: light versus witness. Um, we can still be light. What would that look like? What would that look like? Being light in the world. Example. An example, yeah. Bringing somebody a meal or sending a card or, you know, absolutely people up. Action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. We often call that ministry, right? In churchy terms, ministry. Mm -hmm. How about the verse? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Okay. And how would you let it shine? Through action. Through action. Mm -hmm. So action <laughs> takes on a lot of different definitions for everybody, right? Fruits of the spirit. Fruits of the spirit? Yeah. Yeah. Paul wrote the church of Galatia, remember? And he said the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are actions, right? I want you though to, to broaden your definition. So your Sunday school teacher is asking you what kind of actions to take. And from the rest of the class, you got to think of some, you know, good Christian kind of concept of that, right? But I also want you to recognize that there that your actions don't always get defined by Christian characteristics. Okay, they may deep down be driven by that, but they don't always get defined that way. So um, in the world today. The ability to listen is a tremendous action. It is not something that we do well. And why are we getting worse at this? And so my English teachers would really appreciate this. And the generation behind me is getting worse or yet. Okay? Well, why is that the case? Why do we struggle with this? Well, it's just like now. For instance, when I was growing up with my elders, they would tell me something and I would so try and soak up every word and listen to it. But nowadays, the young people, they don't want to hear it. They know it all. You know, you can't tell them nothing. <laughs> and, and there may be some truth to that, but I would also remind you that probably um, Every generation sees it that way. So I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember it word for word. Um, and it went like this, something like this. The problem with the youth of today is they don't stand up when elders come into the room. Amen. They don't listen to their elders. They're disobedient to their elders. And their parents. They are arrogant in the way that they present themselves and the way that they go about life. You knew who said that? Abraham. Socrates. So we're talking a long time ago. We all felt that way. Every generation, when they get to be about our age, or Pat, you're really old age, they, you know, when they get to that age, they, uh, they all look back and say, this next generation doesn't have it. 
But here's something that I want you to know the trend, the movement, okay? Yes, ma'am. A lot of the people already have an answer before the person's got halfway through the discussion or the question. You usually, you have an answer and don't really listen to what they're saying because I'll tell you how to fix that. Well, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you're right now. Um, again, <coughs> particularly you men, do not look in the direction of my wife, okay? Do, do not look in that direction. <laughs> You're preaching to the Steve, choir. <laughs> Steve Campbell, you, you threw me under the bus before I even started to say something. I want your man card. I think I'm just taking I like seeing her on the road, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so problem solving, generally men, we, we're solving the problem. The women in our lives are talking. I know the answer to this one. As soon as you get done, I can fix this, right? But here's another trend that society is seeing right now that we didn't have when we were teenagers or in our 20s. And that is listening is not a skill that's being developed because social media primarily does what? It goes one way. It goes out. Social media goes out. And um, you, you might remember from a sermon from some months ago that, that I was telling you that um, an average 14-year-old spends six hours a day on social media, okay, average. So now you may say, oh, I have a 14-year-old daughter, grandson, whatever, and they only spend a couple hours. Somebody's making up the difference, right? So whether you believe it or not, and I would suggest this, not to condemn you as a parent or grandparent, because Katie and I will one day deal with this with our grandchildren. Um, you know, you see them and you say, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. They were only on there for a little while. Well, that was just a little while that you happened to notice. So I encourage you to remember that listening is not a highly sought after skill set, and it's not one that we're doing a good job with right now. And so uh, society in general will get worse at, uh, they will get worse at this and not better. Mark Twain said, that when he was 18 years old, he was appalled at how stupid his father was. And by the time he was 21, how much he had learned in three years. Yeah. 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 Same thing when I went overseas. I thought, you know, I was surprised when I came home how smart my mom and dad were. Yeah, it's true. So I just want you to appreciate that, that as we think about action in our lives, there's a lot of things we can do. You've mentioned a number of them. But one, one thing that you can begin to work on is to listen. There's a lot of things we all need to work on, and that's something you'll have to between you and God. Now let's go to verse 9, um, and this is that concept. Look, it says the true light gives light to the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So God became human incarnate. He took on human flesh. Okay? So, again, uh, some of us struggle, but, but just understand this concept that, that Jesus left, he left heaven to come to earth, okay? And because he became fully human and still was fully God, he can understand and appreciate at a different level um, than we could ever begin to imagine. And think of, of the fact that Christ knowingly and obediently made that choice think of that knowingly and obediently made the choice to come down to the earth and that is a huge part of our celebration and part of what should give us joy that god loves humanity so much that he would send his son that his son would come right verse 10 he was in the world and though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him now I asked this question, why didn't the Son of God overwhelm the world with the entrance of Jesus? Well, because that, that wasn't God's plan for him to overwhelm the world. What do you mean by that? For the purpose he came was to save us. And if he came in, you know, top dog and just wiped the Romans out and this, that, and the other, then that, would, that wasn't God's plan. And the free, free will... Doesn't want to get it's a choice. You have the choice whether you want to believe in God or not. And God loves us so much, he said, Look, I'm gonna give you 
you people one more chance. This is the last, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? Believe it or not, I think you do. <laughs> so that there's truth there. I, I'd like for you to maybe twist that just a little bit in your thinking for a moment. Just turn the knob a little bit up and recognize that God who created it decided to humble himself in front of the people he created to get their attention. Stoney? Are you saying God became human or did God's son become human? There we go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. How about that? <laughs> So I, I want you to hear this. Man. Think of the fact of that if, if Jesus came as the creator of the world, he came down uh, in all his glory, all right? And men fell on their faces before him, recognizing that's the son of God. Um, that takes away some of the understanding <clears throat> of the character of God that we have. God's character is not one to just simply overwhelm humanity, to try to win us over, to score points. Our God is a God that loves us so much that he wanted to come and make you understand that he knows what we're going through, that he shares our pain. He shares the problems of humanity. Remember that when Jesus came into the world, as he was growing up, he suffered, he got tired, he got thirsty, he got hungry, okay? He, he had problems in his life because he was human, right? And so um, I, I think if, if nothing else, I hope today that you might hear that the God of all creation loves us so much that he would come into the world and become one of us so that we could understand that he is willing to do whatever he can to draw us to him. Not to overwhelm us and throw us in such a state of, oh my goodness, is the power of God and how can we stand before that? That will happen one day, particularly at his second coming. But it, it, he didn't choose to introduce his son that way. All right? Now look at Levin. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize that. Did not recognize it. What, what does John mean by that? The Jews did it, yeah. Yeah. And, and John is specifically talking about the Jews didn't recognize him. I want you to put that in 2022. That's another thing. Excuse me, Doug. Yes. When Jesus was performing all these miracles, and oy vey, the Jews still didn't get it. Who he was. They they um they struggled with that. There's no question. Yeah. Some did, some did, many didn't, most didn't. Is it any different today? Nope. Probably not. Probably not. So humanity always has struggled with this concept of who is God and how do we interact with Him, right? But but to that which was His own. So think of this. John's kind of referring to the Jews. But before we pile on the Jews and say how they weren't very bright and they didn't understand things, and how could they not possibly see that, um, I want you to also recognize does it happen to us? Mm -hmm. Do we sometimes fail to recognize Jesus in our own life? As people of the faith, as people who say, I am a Christian, how many times or what parts of your life is Jesus not involved in at all? So if we, if we drew a big circle, we called that your life. Um, does Jesus have a little slice of your life? Is that uh, just to find it? Is that a Sunday morning? Is that, is that what he has? Or, or does, he have, um, does he have maybe a, a part of your family life? Does he have... Is he involved in your money? How about your time? I mean, um, is Jesus involved in your time? And then we say, well, uh, as a Christian, you know, it's something I need to uh, always have with me. Is, is Jesus part of your work? 
and not you know, guilty as charged, but how many times in our world of work do we get so focused and we're so goal oriented that, um, you know, if you said to somebody, hey, you know, I'm a Christian, they go, what? Did that happen? So as you begin to think about where is God in your life, where is Jesus in your life, um, you know, we, we say that Jesus came to that which was his own, which is all of humanity. And his own humanity did not recognize. So I know that I am guilty. And I want to be different. For me to say I will do better is an attitude. It's not a plan. Right? I used to always appreciate that. And, and uh, the, the people that I often supervise, they would come and say, uh, gosh, boss, I really screwed that up, but I'm going to do better. I'd say, that's a great attitude for what you're planning to do better. So, yes, you want to be a better Christian. That's a great attitude for what you're planning to be a better Christian. It takes, it takes some energy and effort to do that. Right? So look at your life. Look at all of your life, a big circle of your life. How much is, is God in that? And if there are parts of your life where God isn't in, and I don't know where that'll be for you, you have to decide that, but wherever that is, then how do you get God into that part of your life? And so I mean, we think that that's written only to the Jews. I think it's written to Doug Ray. I think it's written to you, fill in your, fill in your name, okay? Now, Hello. yes, sir. I look back, since you talk about your life, I look back on my life, and for many, I'm ashamed to say this, but for a very long time, God didn't have any part of my life, you know? And I'm so thankful that he didn't pull my name out of hell a long time ago. He gave me, kept saying, well, we don't want him up here. No, I'm going to give you that one more chance. You know, thank you, Lord. Well, and, and, and you know, there are, there are most people, we don't get to vote, but just to let you know, we get to vote in here. So, <laughs> so you better you better take care of us, all right? Let's go to let's go to twelve. Yet to, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So I want you to recognize that is a promise. Okay, some of you come from churches where um, you you have felt maybe been erroneously taught maybe you have read scriptures but not combined them maybe quite correctly and and so you believe that it is conditional that your eternal life is conditional and let me dispel that for you because this this is here you you go to um 112 is a great one you get to all who did receive receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. Okay? That's it, folks. Your works don't get you there. Your works can't get you there. Because no matter who you are, if you take the sum of your life, there's parts of it where God hasn't infiltrated. You haven't let him in. Maybe you failed to succeed at the level that you think God would have you be, if that's the case, it's based on your works. Ain't none of us got it in the whole right? And so I just encourage you to remember that that is a promise. It is a kind of a promise that, that cannot be broken because God, throughout Old and New Testament, God is not a liar. You hear that uh, written actually in the scripture. So, but what action is needed here? So, um, he, he says, but yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. So, so look at the simplicity of faith, the simplicity of eternal life, right? The simplicity of it. Received him, believe in his name. That's it. That's it. Don't make it more complex than that. Now, after that happens, we get in some complexity, right? How do we how do we walk through our faith and how do we live out our faith and how do we practice our faith and, and witness to our faith? Those can be some uh, some kind of complex things, but these are pretty simple 
okay? These are pretty simple. So don't make the decision to become a Christian for you or for others more complex than that. <clears throat> you know, if you, if you need additional support to that, you know, John 3, 16 is, is a common one. Uh, Romans 10, 19 is a, is a very common one that, that you can go to and it'll just help you understand the simplicity of this, of this action. That people have made their Christian beliefs and faith so complex and so difficult that it excludes a lot of people. And then they beat themselves up because they recognize, well, Lord, you're never going to have me now because I just did this. All right? But it said to all those who believe, those who have received it, don't let other people complicate the action. Right? And then look at verse 13. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So he's talking about the fact of that no human can decide if you are going to be an eternity or not. No human can decide that. I can't decide that. Pastor Larry can't. No, the Pope can't decide that. Nobody can decide that. They're not the judge of you and I. I'm not your judge and you're not my judge. And I'm glad you aren't my judge because you know me well enough that I've been excluded a long time ago, right? So, uh, but we also recognize that, that it's not a human decision and it's not a husband's will, meaning that your birth lineage means nothing, okay? Your, your physical presence means nothing. <coughs> it's the fact of that it is God's will that you be with him. Now, here's where I'm going to spend a little bit of time. Um, I, I am nowhere near understanding Greek or, or Hebrew very well, but I do want you to understand something that in the Hebrew language, names were very, they had very important meanings, okay? The story of Jacob and Esau, you remember the story of the twins? And um, do you remember that uh, when they were born, that Jacob came out and he was clasping Esau's heel? And the, the family kind of laughed about that, and they named him Jacob, which means what? Deceiver. He was trying to deceive everybody by pulling Esau back in and being first, because the first got all the blood rights. Now, how did Jacob live out his life? He lived out his life as a deceiver, okay? Names mean something to Hebrews. They mean a lot more than they do to you and me, okay? Um, I mean, Doug means... Awesome one, enlightened one, those kind of things. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> See, you looked at my wife again. You guys have got to stop doing that. Well, Doug, I'll give you a good example. You know, I asked Dad where his mom and grandparents come up with it because I'm a junior. Where they come up with the name Omer, it's in the Bible. And the Israelites gathered so many Omers of bread, the manna from heaven. So I looked it up to see what it's equivalent to. And it said, Omer, same as or equal to two bricks shy of the loaf. That's right. <laughs> and you're living it out. Now you're living it out. Okay? Yep. <laughs> now here's what I want you to recognize. When we say the name Jesus, that's actually a alliteration, transliteration from Greek. Okay? Because the New Testament at that time, the, the Bible is written in three languages, primarily Koine Greek, which would be a common um, lexicon. It would be... Uh, much like American English, it wouldn't be formal King's English, right? Koine Greek was common language. Uh, odds are, statistically, most biblical scholars believe that Jesus spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, which was a common language in the Middle East, okay, in, in that part of the world. Um, Hebrew was used more formally in religious events and, and uh, in, in education. But Aramaic was, was spoken on the street because of all the neighbors. Remember, in, in Jesus' day, Jerusalem and Palestine, what he called Israel at that time, was a, kind of a crossroads. So they spoke Aramaic. And then Jesus probably spoke Greek because Greek was coming into the region. It was spoke quite honestly by a lot of people. And many of the Romans spoke Greek. So of course, Latin as well, but they spoke Greek because that was more of a world language at that point. All right? So here's what's important. We say Jesus, which is Greek. Um, the English transliteration of that, Mr. Bennett, is Joshua, right? 
But in Jesus' day, they wouldn't say Joshua. That's that's what, how we would have said his name. They say Yeshua. 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 And here's what that Hebrew name means. To deliver, to rescue. Another a transliteration of it is Jehovah is salvation. Okay? Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, Yeshua, because uh, there's it's neat how God works when you think about it. Um, if you think about the Israelites escaping from Egypt, you know the story, right? And and they're wandering around in the desert, and Moses is leading them. Okay, Moses is symbolic of the law, right? He's symbolic of the law, but the people have not yet entirely been redeemed because they haven't made it to the promised land. Moses, the law, is not allowed to take him into the promised land. Who takes him into the promised land? Joshua. Joshua becomes their deliverer. Okay, uh, you would the the, the 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 seminary title would be it is a typology of Christ. Okay, he is a typology of Christ. He's a type of Christ to give us the understanding that God had Joshua, Yeshua, the Jewish name or Hebrew name. Yeshua brought them in, the people of God, into the promised land. He was the general. Yeah. He was the general. Yeah, he, he, he was, he was the leader. Them, Jesus came along, the same name was a general. Mm -hmm. Yep, as, as the great deliverer, right? So think of this, uh, Yeshua, Joshua, um, that, that stone cutter that he was, at least according to uh, Cecil P. DeMille in, yeah. uh, in the Moses movie, um, you know, he took them in from the law, Moses represented the law, into the promised land as the deliverer of the people. He provided salvation to the people by bringing them into the promised land. Jesus came to the world. Yeshua came into the world to be the deliverer. Jehovah is salvation. So, Names mean something, and I wanted you to see going backwards here what this really means. And so, um, and, and you would say now, we, we say Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ, okay? Um, you know, Greek for, he is the deliverer, right? Um, if you were Jewish and you were presented that name, you would say uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, HaMashiach. And, and so that means, if you look at this, it's, it's the Messiah, the anointed. So a good Hebrew would have heard the name Yeshua, Yeshua. They knew, they knew that there was meaning to that name, right? They recognized the meaning to the name. And the biblical writers of John's day, as they begin to write these things, if you look at some of Paul's writings, he talks about this concept of, of you know the law and the prophets and and that that Jesus is the new covenant and that's where you have in some of your if you were looking at uh, some of the early translations of the King James the original King James it would say the old covenant and the new covenant we call it today the old testament the new testament okay. so i just want you to appreciate uh the concept and, and because names mean something, right? Particularly to Hebrew people. Now, just as a point of trivia for you, um, as the dysphoria or what's called the dispersion of Jews happened throughout a time period, um, and it started actually before Jesus, the Babylonians dispersed the Jews, and then eventually they got dispersed everywhere. Before they came back and formed the, the, or the, uh, the nation of Israel in 1948, by UN action, uh, the Hebrew language had virtually been lost. If you were Jewish, you would speak Hebrew. Okay. But uh, about 19, in the 1920s and 1930s, a couple of people began to recognize that, that they needed to be blessed again by God uh, in the way they saw God. And so they began to uh, practice and learn Hebrew, and eventually when they, they moved back in to a nation in 1948, they began to really push, and some people began to become prominent in the gov new government of Israel, they began to push. So it, today, um, they're only the fourth generation in recent history 
who speak Hebrew on a regular basis. So um, that's why for many Hebrews, their names don't mean what they used to during Jesus' day because they understood what a name meant. All right. Now uh, you can you can do this study on your own because we're running out of time. But it did want you to recognize that David even spends time prophesizing, so to speak, about God because um, he uses this name, this concept of uh, Yeshua Hamashiach um, in, in Psalm 14, uh, 7. It says, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. Okay, and, and that translated technically is, oh, that the anointed one would come out of Israel, out of Zion. Zion means it. So, um, and then again in 4016, the Psalm 51 12, salvation is used a lot. And the, the, the actual translation of that is Yeshua. Okay, so when you begin to understand that, you begin to recognize that God had a plan all along of bringing Jesus into the world. So, we ask the question, what child is this? As you sing that song, sing that hymn, but just recognize that that child was planned. Very specifically to be the salvation of the world. Okay? Yeshua Hamashiach. All right, let's send the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. You had this plan. And even though you fulfilled that plan, sometimes we miss it. We miss it in parts of our lives. We, we allow Jesus into some, but not all. Sometimes we miss the Savior. We miss why that child did come. So help us to answer in our own personal lives, in our own little personal space, what child is this? What child is this? And will I choose to believe and to receive? In Jesus' name.